look not just at the book of Genesis, but as the whole Bible relates to biblical creationism. And that is a subject that is vastly important and slightly controversial in some churches, but we're going to attempt to iron all of it out and to uh, approach it from a scriptural perspective and a logical perspective to see just what what is the truth, what is the myth, and what what can we believe and why about biblical creation. So in the beginning, what is a big question, right? In the beginning, what? Let's start with something small. We're in this building where we attend church. Was anyone here when this building was built? <laughs> Any of us, were we here when this building was built? No. Is it eternal? Probably not. But how do we know that? How do we know anything about the beginning of this building? Even if we talk to someone who claims to have been here when it was built, we can't know whether it was built or whether it just always was. Right? Even if we look at a document that's signed by a government official that says this building was built by such and such a company on such and such a date, we still have to believe what we're told in that document. As official as it might be, we have to believe it. We can't know about the beginning of this building. The same way, on a larger scale, no one was there at the beginning of the universe. The beginning of all things. None of us were there. I know I wasn't there. I'm not that old. <laughs> right? However long ago it might have been, I can't know when it happened or what happened. But I can believe based off of an official account. You see the difference? So when I have to believe it, but I can't know it, that's faith. And faith, by a dictionary definition, is confidence or trust in a person or a thing. That's an interesting sort of small condition, personal confidence trust. Belief in something, not necessarily based on proof. We just talked about I have to believe it, I can't know it. Or, specifically, belief in God, or a God, or in the doctrines or teachings of religion. That concept of faith from a dictionary perspective can be supplemented by the definition of faith from a biblical perspective. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the chapter 11 of Hebrews is what we refer to as the hall of faith. The entire chapter refers to men and women of faith in the history of the Bible. But the very first verse of Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we see the two different sides of that, hope and not seen. We hope for something that has not yet been, but then we believe something that we cannot see. It is not tangible, but we have evidence of it. We haven't seen it yet, but we have substance. We have belief that it will come, right? So both of those aspects apply to our faith from a biblical perspective. But if you see in that verse, it, uh, also in verse, sorry, <laughs> verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 5, this was the other, the other uh, reference I wanted to use, Paul speaking to the Corinthians the second time in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse 7, as a parenthetical phrase, says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It doesn't mean that we don't use sight at all, but our impetus to take a step is not based off of what we see or what we or the, the, the process of sight, right? It, I think that word in the Greek means more than just using your eyes, but the, the entire sense. But it's not that, that we make that decision to step in life, to move based off of what we see, but what we believe. I can step on this floor because I believe I won't fall through. 
right? I can sit in a chair because I believe I won't break it. But it's not because I see that I won't break it. There's nothing I can see about this chair that tells me it won't break. I just have to believe that because I saw Pastor sit in it, <laughs> that I can sit in it and it won't break. <laughs> so if we get faith first and sight second, they will always agree. The reverse isn't necessarily true. We could also say this in a catchy way. Faith and sight don't always agree, but they do when faith is allowed to lead. So if we get faith before sight, then we can walk by faith, not by sight. And we can always make sure that those two things agree. So the next question then, the in the very beginning, like we talked about, we can't know. We have to believe. There are really, when you boil it down, two general views of the beginning. If there is a beginning, there are two general views. One of those comes from the standpoint of the theory of creation, that God created the heaven and the earth. The other comes from the standpoint of evolution, that in a, with the Big Bang Theory, believes that nothing became something. Okay? Both of those theories are diametrically opposed to each other. You cannot have part of each. It's one or the other. Because they are mutually exclusive, as we say in English. If one exists, the other, if one is true, the other cannot be true. If the other is true, the one cannot be true. The theories of creation and evolution, I submit, are both belief systems. Neither can be science as it relates to origins, to begin. So what's science then? Another definition here. Science is a branch of knowledge or study dealing with a body of, this is the key words, facts or truths that are systematically arranged and showing the operation of general laws. Right? It's also a systematic knowledge of the physical or material world that is gained through, these are the key words, observation and experimentation. Okay? If you have to believe it, you can't know it, it can't be a fact or truth. You can believe it to be a truth, but it cannot be considered objectively a fact if it cannot be proven. Okay? So then that's, that's one way we have to see that the science Science can support the belief of origins, a theory of origins, but it cannot be a science in and of itself because it's, there are no facts that are provable. Also, from the concept of observation and experimentation, you can't observe the beginning, you can't recreate the beginning, and you can't experiment with the beginning of all things. Thus, science cannot apply to the beginning. I know going way off here, but I'm trying to build toward what we're going to talk about. Creation as a, as a uh, d d definition, right? Secular definition. There's all these from multiple um, dictionaries. Creation is defined as the act of bringing the world into ordered existence. So it assumes in its definition that all existence is orderly, right? We can see that. We can see the evidence all around us of order in our bodies in the animals and plants around us, in the, the, the stellar bodies, there's order in all of it. And so that ordered existence being brought into the world by an act or an action is what we what is defined as creation. Thus creationism, because I said biblical creationism, would be a doctrine or a theory holding that matter, the various forms of life, and the world were created by God, big G, out of nothing, usually in the way described in the book of Genesis. Okay? Note that this theory of creationism accounts for origins of everything, living and non-living, through the account in Genesis, and as a theory, also accounts for the persistence of everything. Right? Because it accounts for the beginning, 
and the persistence. It's in and of itself a complete theory. That's, that's key to, to, to realize. Evolution, by definition, is descent with modification from pre-existing species or cumulative inherited change in a population of organisms through time leading to the appearance of new forms. It is the process by which new species or populations of living things develop from pre-existing forms through successive generations. So that's a lot of words, but the key to, to uh, drill down on with evolution is that new things that never existed before came out of pre-existing things that already existed. But that definition, leading to evolutionism, as I would say the belief system, right, is advocacy of or belief in the theory of evolution, especially as formulated by Charles Darwin. So our creationism theory said God, especially as in Genesis, and evolutionism says this theory of evolution, especially as from Charles Darwin. So the sources of both of them, Genesis or Darwin, and the action of one, or the actor of one is God, and of the other, is the esoteric concept of evolution itself. One might say Mother Nature, right? But here's the fact. No one was there at the beginning. We can prove that, right? None of us was alive at the beginning. Second, no one can know what happened at the beginning. We can only attempt with contemporary observation to support one theory or the other. Of, where, of what happened at the beginning and when it happened. But as I've said before, both of those theories are mutually exclusive. So the beginning of all things cannot be reproduced, recreated, observed, or experimented on. Therefore, the study of the beginning is not science. Evolutionism and creationism, at least as they re relate to origins, are both religious fields of study. Either you believe one of two things, in the beginning, God, or in the beginning, nothing. And that tells a lot about your character and what you're willing to believe. So science, in and of itself, as we talked about with facts or truth, observation and experimentation, science cannot prove anything. Have you heard that before? Or is that a shocking statement? Science cannot prove anything, but it can disprove anything. The point of scientific experimentation, observation, and study is to have a hypothesis and to try to falsify it. And if you can't falsify it, you might be able to continue to study it. If you can falsify it, then you can adjust your hypothesis and continue to experiment. If you gain support for your hypothesis, it could one day become a postulate, or it could one day become a theory, right? But you can never prove anything with science. This point is actually brought up in, a, uh, a, in several textbooks and, and other scientific publications. One specifically that I like is from J.L. Wilde. He's a doctor in several different um, sciences, but he's also a professor and a textbook author because of the textbook that I got this out of, and a Christian. And he actually on his website says, I'm a scientist who's a Christian, mm -hmm. not a Christian who is a scientist. And not because he doesn't want Christianity to be his identity, but he doesn't want people to immediately dismiss mm -hmm. his qualifications as a scientist. And he defines, or he defends the statement that science cannot prove anything from a book from Sir Karl Popper, P-O-P-P-E-R. Sir Karl Popper wrote the book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. And in The Logic of Scientific Discovery, he says science cannot prove anything. He shows quite clearly that science cannot prove anything, and that it can, but that it can falsify ideas that are currently thought to be true. So at any given time, true science could throw on its head things that we assumed to be true. 
if anyone ever assumed the Earth was flat, science could prove them wrong. Right? It could disprove their belief that the, the Earth was flat by sailing past the horizon and not falling off into space. Right? There are several different ways mathematically and physically, nautically, that you can prove uh, or disprove the theory that the Earth, you can't prove the Earth is round, you can disprove that the Earth is flat. Does that make sense? I know it's sort of semantics, but the whole approach to science should be from a stance of falsification. Make an assumption, try to prove it wrong. Right? So on that basis, as we move forward, we talk about what we do believe and what we don't believe and why. And the, the concept is apologetics in the English. Um, apologia, I think, was the Greek. The concept of defending, right? Like in a, def a defense in front of a court. And to be able to know what you believe, why you believe it, and provide a defense for it. So this creation is a, creation and evolution is a large uh, subject amongst biblical apologetics. What do I believe and why do I believe it? Can I defend it? There's, there's much more that can be done with apologetics and we may get into that later. But as far as a, um, a breakdown here, we won't have a lot of time to get fully into all of this, but as by way of introduction, I would say biblically the best distilled version of what we believe from the Bible and how, how we could approach it going forward is actually uh, distilled, as, as a good word, um, put down into to small bits that we can understand, by the, the Greek answers in Genesis. Uh, Ken Ham, originally from Australia, an American citizen, started the Creation um, Evidences Museum, I think, in uh, Indiana. In, uh, oh, it's in the Creation Museum. Yeah, just the Creation Museum. Just off of Cincinnati. Right. Ohio, that's right. Uh, the Creation Museum, he has the Ark Encounter, where they built a scale model of Noah's Ark, and you can go through it as a, as a museum and learning things. They have lots and lots of, of um, media and uh, interactive studies about biblical apologetics and the Bible itself. But they broke this down into the seven seas of history so that all of the points from Genesis to the end of Revelation that matter to the timeline of history, they can start with a C. I love alliteration. I don't know if anybody else likes alliteration as much as I do. But I love alliteration. And so this one, I have a larger chart that I'm going to get framed. It's about this long, but it's not quite as tall, uh, that breaks all of this out into different references and Lots of stuff, and when I get a frame, I could bring it in and maybe put it up back here. Um, but the very first C of history is creation. So what that means is that 6,000 years ago, according to the Bible, right? I believe the Bible teaches a young Earth creation, not an old Earth creation of eons and eons of time. The secular scientists with evolution try to say that we are the, the universe is 20 billion years old. I have no idea how they think they can prove that, but I know that the Bible says six to about 6,000 years. If you follow genealogies through, through the, that are meticulously recorded throughout the Bible, about 6,000 years ago, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there's, I have a chart for this too. I have it digitally, I don't have it um, on hard copy, but we're gonna figure out the projection thing so I can try to bring it up and show. But basically what the chart shows is if you look at Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, you look at Colossians 1.16, there is biblical scriptural evidence of the creation of the universe, and it's assumed that God exists. It's, ex it's assumed that God is who he says he is, and it is assumed that he did what he said he did. A literal 24-hour day, six-day creation, about 6,000 years ago. The key point there was that all things were created out of nothing, ex nihilo, by God, by his, the word of God specifically, that he spoke it into existence. But John 1.1 1, 1 says that the word of God is Jesus. And in, uh, in Colossians, we're learning that Jesus was the creative power used by God. 
All things were created by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So that six literal 24-hour days of creation happened about 6,000 years ago, and God called it very good. It was a perfect creation. But then the second C is corruption, and that man, the first man, Adam, sinned. And sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So then Romans 5.12, where we get that from, the key point was that there was no death in God's perfect creation until man sinned. And man's sin brought death into the world. His disobedience is the specific sin that brought death and corruption into the creation. Okay? Then God showed in Eden his redemptive plan of by, by taking the ram instead of killing them immediately and sacrificing the ram, which was a picture or type of Jesus Christ, to cover their sin. And his, so his plan from the beginning was to be perfect. Man messed it up and corrupted it, but he still had another plan to redeem us out of that. And we continue through. The sin that was brought into the world um, was judged by God. About 4,400 years ago, there was a catastrophe, and that catastrophe was a global flood. Not a localized flood in the Mesopotamian Valley, but a global, worldwide, catastrophic flood. And God sent that flood to destroy his entire creation because of man's wickedness. Not because of the wickedness of the dinosaurs, or the wickedness of the fishes, or the wickedness of mosquitoes, though I think that mosquitoes are wicked. The, <laughs> the wickedness of man was judged by God in wiping out all of creation. And he saved one family and a collection of animals to repopulate the world. We see that in Genesis chapter 6. The key point there is that a perfect God must judge sin. And he showed again his plan for redemption by saving a remnant alive through the door of the ark, which we learn in John chapter 10 was Jesus Christ. So the ram in Eden that redeemed Adam and Eve was Jesus Christ. And the door of the ark that saved Noah and his family and all the animals was Jesus Christ. But then we have the next sea, which is confusion. After Noah's family started to repopulate the earth, God told them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, fill the whole earth. But they didn't do that. They localized themselves. And then got it in their head that they were going to build a tower to heaven. So God judged their sin of disobedience again by confusing the languages and scattering them across the world and forcing them to fulfill his, his will of populating the earth by confusing the language. So he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. We see this in this story in Genesis 9 through 11. God has a perfect plan for us. And it is always better to humbly submit to his will than to get our own ideas about what we're supposed to do and disobey him because it will always lead to pain and suffering. From the confusion, we lead all the way through the prophets and the rest of the history to Christ. And Christ, who was the creator, the son of God, was sent to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, and to die a death on the cross. And the fact that he came down to earth to be a man, to put himself in our position, um, to be able to show us what it's like to obey the perfect will of God completely. Not like Adam, incompletely. But to be the second Adam, as we see in the book of Romans, to fulfill the entire law of God. To be the only being to ever do that. And so then, in his perfect life, he died the death we owed because of our sin, not because of his, on the cross. And so then, this perfect man who lived, the God, God himself, who lived as a perfect man, as Christ, then suffered the death on the cross that we owed, and then rose again, providing life for all who trust in him. And we see that in Romans 5, 8, John 3, 16, 2 Corinthians 5, 11, 14, 15, and 17. As I said, the creator condescended to be a man, obeyed God in every way, unlike Adam, then gave himself for his creation as the perfect sacrifice, pointing back to the ram in Eden. All along the way, Christ has been shown. And then the final C will be in the future. Again, this is, the, this is all the history, the evidence of things unseen, then the substance of things hoped for, right, in the definition of faith, consummation. 
This is the imminent return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as God promises a new heaven and a new earth after the second coming for all believers at his return. So God will cast out death. He will cast out the disobedient. And he looks, and we as Christians look in faith, as I said, for this blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as we will dwell with him eternally. And we have 6,000 years of evidence to believe what the Bible teaches about what is coming. So that, in, one, in a single pager, <laughs> is uh, the, the concept of we can, use, we can believe the Bible, and we can use the Bible apologetically to support the belief of creationism. And so all of the information we have here, we will look at um, in the coming weeks, we will look at the evidences of scripture and history that uh, allow us to look back to believe what the Bible says about the beginning and everything after it. We can't believe any of the Bible if we can't believe the first 11 chapters. And so that focus on the first 11 chapters of Genesis is quintessential to believing the rest of the Bible. Because if I can't believe God then, I can't believe God now. So we'll look at history and prophecy and scripture to see evidence of creation. We'll also look around us at creatures and plants to find evidence of creation. We'll look within us the evidence in man, both in its history and in its present state, for evidence of creation. We'll look at the geology and fossils beneath us. That's another historical record that's been laid down by God, I think, in his providence. Not because it would mess him up, but because it will show his glory if we're, if we're actually honest about what we look at. Again, for evidence of creation. And then we can look into the sky. We can look up as the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then we can look at the evidence that's provided for us by the enemy, by our opposition. And all of that will culminate together to what, it, what do we believe about creation? Why, why can we say, yes, I believe the Bible, and this is why, and defend that. So I hope you'll uh, be along for the ride, and that it wasn't too much that I was able to, to get across there. Any questions before we pray? And, uh, what was number four? Number four. Yes. Number four was confusion. The Tower of Babel incident. And what was three? Three was catastrophe. The flood. But I'll, I'll leave this right here so you can you get the notes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a room kind of going in the USA or in England, in Germany, in Western culture. They used to teach uh, Bible or 